Um, so <laughs> the pressure's on, you know. <laughs> um, but um, he's got a really great story to tell, and I hope you enjoy it. Okay, thank you. Okay, do I need a microphone, or can you hear me like this? I need a mic. I don't need a mic. Okay, now I'm going to tell you my story. However, I don't want. I do not want to hear a pin drop. So I need you to absorb every word. Do I have your word? Do I have your word? Yes. Thank you. Okay. This is who I am. My real name is Luis Antonio Vasquez Rodriguez Cruz Colon Lopez. That was my. That's my real name. However, I go by Luis Antonio Vasquez. And then I found out two years ago that my real last name should have been Flores because my grandfather married my, 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 my grandmother and my grandmother gave my father Vasquez. That was her side of the family, not his. But anyway, to make a long story short, I'm really in Flores. But my father died of Vasquez and so will I. And they're on it. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. When I first started school, I only spoke Spanish. Siempre estaba hablando puro español. Español todo el tiempo. How many of you bilingual? No. Si, como no, verdad? So at home we only spoke Spanish. My mother went up to fourth grade. She could not read or write. My mother could not read or write. But she knew how to write her name. My father almost made it to seventh grade. Almost made it to seventh grade. And he tells me that he quit school. I think they escorted him out. <laughs> when I first started school, I only spoke Spanish, and they called me Luis. Luis Antonio Vasquez. Luis. I always knew when I was in trouble, because I would hear this. Luis Antonio Vasquez. And you, oh man, I'm gonna get cooked. I would say, Luis Mijo. All right, words of endearment, that was beautiful. So, I start school and I only spoke Spanish. And uh, I was born in inner city, south side Chicago. I mean, we moved to a small town, huh? 5050 Carpenter. I live in a two flat upstairs. I knew it was Now you gave me an idea. Okay. So then what happened was that we moved to Rock Falls. You see, my father, he used to work in the fields. He was part of that placebo program back in 1948. And the fascinating thing about that, he was Puerto Rican. Puerto Rico was a part of the Brasero program along with the Mexicans, so they put them all together to work in the fields. Then my father got a job at the railroad, Northwestern Railroad, and he used to be gone 15 days at a, at a time. And my poor mother, they came here in 48, and my mother, like many men at those times, uh, my mother's brothers came and they left their wives and their children in Puerto Rico. My mom refused to leave the children, and here's a woman that could not speak English, couldn't read or write sold the pigs she had and her little house so forth and she flew in a two engine plane with ten kids because the women in Florida said forget it these are your brother's kids she brought them off to the United States that plane stopped in Miami it stopped in the Carolinas then in Chicago and she came off that plane this five foot woman with ten of the kids and they weren't even hurt they were not even hers. So I started school. They didn't know what to do with me. And let me show you what I looked like. That's Luis Antonio Vasquez, 1962. That's Abuelita Martina, when I was two years old, walking me through the grass, and that's been the middle. When I started school, I refused to go to school unless I had a white shirt and a bow tie on and black pants. And I went to a public school. Public school. And since I only spoke Spanish, they didn't know what to do with me. So I, I remember taking all these little tests. All I know is I was diagnosed and educally mentally handicapped. In those days, they used the word, I was called retarded. I got put in special education. And in special education, they had this portable on the other side of the playground. So when you walked through the school, went across the playground, and you went to the portable, that's where all us special ed kids were. And I spent the whole day cleaning kids and feeding them that were in wheelchairs, that wore helmets, couldn't hold their head up. 
never learned to read or write at that time. My name was also changed to Lewis. I'll never forget the day when my teacher said, Luis, and I started, started I stuttered really bad. And I'll go, yes, because one thing with stutters, we learn a wide range of vocabulary because we try to make up words and fix words to make sure if we can't say the word that we're stuck on. They say, we're gonna I'm gonna land hard. And that's what we would do, and you make up. Well, I go home and I tell my father, my dad goes, Luis, ven para acá, Luis, come here. And I say, no, dad, man, you know. Yo no me llamo Luis. Mi maestro me dijo que me llamo Luis. And he goes, Luis, your teacher said that you, your name is Luis. That's what he told me back in Spanish. He goes, si, sí, Luis, I mean Luis. He goes, soy Luis. No, it is Luis. Soy Luis. No, it is Luis. Back then, back then that was called discipline. How many of you did discipline? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I think so many hands are going to go up. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, anyway, so anyway, back then I was disciplined. So my name at home was Luis, and my name at school was Lewis, and I never told my father that they were calling me Lewis at school. They called me Lewis at school. And since I got tested in 1962, PL 194 did not pass until 1965. So they didn't have to tell our parents where they placed us in school. They never knew I was in special education. They never knew. They never knew that I was in special education. And then one day something happened. By the way, every time I got caught speaking Spanish, they bring me up to the front of the class. And I grab my ankles and they hit me with the board until I cried and they sent me back to my seat. But don't worry, all my cousins were in there with me. <laughs> all my cousins were in there with me. Little by little, I started to learn a little bit of English. A little bit of English. And the teacher took a liking to me. I mean, look at me. Who could not like such a child? <laughs> and they took a liking to me. So, and then we noticed something. Well, the teacher paid a lot more attention to me than the others. And I was one of the lighter, complexed ones. And let me tell you, the color of my skin has given me privileges that I had used to open doors for everyone else that I come in contact with. Because my color, I know how it can be used in this country. So I'm not gonna sugarcoat it for you and tell you. Because my relatives and my cousins were dark complexion. So whenever we wanted something, we would caucus. Here we are, six, seven years old. We would caucus together. I would go ask the teacher. Nine times out of 10, we got what we wanted. And so I had become the ambassador of the class. <laughs> One day my mom got her arm hurt. She was washing clothes. And how many remember those old, well, she probably all did, those old roller machines, you know? She tried to pull up, all right? And her arm went through. And the hospital was near our school. See, by then I, started, I became the interpreter for my family. I became the interpreter for my family. Everywhere we went, I would interpret. I had gained a lot of social capital. I learned to negotiate with adults when I was seven, eight years old. I even went and helped my dad buy his first house when I negotiated the contract with the person that was doing the deed at that age, at that age. And what had happened was my mom hurt her arm. So right away my dad, the household was by the school, he came by to pick me up to interpret. Because you know you gotta have your interpreter. <laughs> and when he came by, he came into school. And Mr. Uh, Mr. Lineball, he was the principal. I still remember that guy, he's not this big. And he said, ¿Dónde está Luis Antonio? Where's Luis Antonio? Nobody knew. Where's Luis Antonio? Nobody knew. Guess who knows everything in your office? Who knows? The secretary. The secretary goes, oh, you mean Luis? Okay, let me take you to him. Okay. I took my father to the whole school, took him outside, took him to this portable. She opens the door. He sees me cleaning this child that I just got done feeding. It was in a wheelchair. My dad walks in, hits the ceiling, goes, Mi hijo no es retardado. My son is not retarded. I don't know what happened. I got to go to the hospital with mom and dad. I interpreted everything. Two weeks later, they put me in a regular class. And I hated it. 
It was the worst thing. I hated it. I was away from my cousins. I was away from my friends. Remember that, because that's going to come up later in the story. And I hated it. Oh my God, did I hate it. And of course, when I was young, I, I used to go up with my mother uh, shopping. And when we went shopping, Dad would give us money. At six or seven years old, I learned how to divide, multiply, add, and subtract all my debt. I didn't need paper. And because guess what would happen if I came home with the wrong change? I would get <laughs> discipline. <laughs> One more time, I would get discipline. So what happened was that I learned. And when they put me in the regular classroom, they tried to get me And How many of you remember the SRAs, those that are closer to my age, when you had to do those little things to read about uh, Jack and Jill going up some, some, some hill to get some water and stuff, right? Okay. I never made it to the first color. And I knew my math, though. Man, I know my math. Teachers gave me a math test, and I didn't write out how I got the answers, and they thought I cheated. So now I got accused of cheating. So then they had a teacher stand over me and give me a new test, and I did it again. And that's when they realized I knew how to do math. I could add, multiply, subtract, and divide. All in my head. Because I can, even when I close my eyes today, I can still see the numbers inside my head. And I work them around. And I never worked out on paper. So I got put into the highest math courses. Remedial English, though, remedial science, remedial social science. <laughs> but my math, whoo, at the top. Comes at the top. Oh, time went on. By fourth grade, I started to learn to read a little bit. Because you have to remember, I only spoke Spanish, and I started to learn more English. I still stuttered, though. I would go, I still go, and I, and I would still stutter. Got up to almost middle school, and uh, still mainstream in my, in, my, in my courses. By the way, I hated to go to the lunch hour. Did you know what happened at lunch hour? Yeah, that's right. They would come up. I'm going to touch a young man with my toe. It's okay. They would put their fit, their, their thumb between their fingers and get me like this. And they would tell us a special ed. I didn't use that hard <laughs> And you know what that was? Those were called cootie shots. And the reason you got a cootie shot was so the retardedness wouldn't rub off on the other person. And they would come up and line us up and hit us that way. So lunch hour would come, and I still go eat with the special ed students. And what we used to call the normals, they would go first, and they would go eat. And so when we got up to uh, high school, and I'm sure what it looked like in high school, things started to change. <laughs> I had my throat. <laughs> Go ahead, get it out of your system. <laughs> okay. When I got to high school, when I got to high school, my counselor put me in four years of vocational classes. I had auto mechanics, graphic arts, construction, uh, and there was one that oh, electricity. I know how to put up a, a fan without getting electrocuted. So, uh, however, I had algebra one. Geometry, Algebra 2, Calculus, and Advanced College Math. And all the other courses were Remedial Science, Remedial uh, English, and Remedial Social Sciences. All of a sudden, I get to my junior year. And this is what I look like. I have my throat. I love my dad's uh, car, 1947, two-door uh, two Dodge Coupe, three on the column. Beautiful, six, uh, 600 flathead, couldn't beat it. Oh, yeah, that's fine. That's my beautiful car. And, um, and this one, by the way, when I took that picture, that was, that was my own bow tie shirt. I borrowed a uh, sports coat from my other cousin, I borrowed pants from my other cousin because she realized there were nine of us. I have six younger brothers and two older sisters. Six younger brothers, so we grew up in a two bedroom house in Stirling, Illinois, once we moved out to Chicago. Two bedroom house. And guess what? We had enough room for everybody. And when one person ate, we all ate. And when one person suffered, we all suffered. And we took care of each other. And we took care of each other. I was the oldest of the boys. Had two older sisters, one passed away two years ago. And I missed her. Anyway, so they were 15 years older than me and, and, and 10 years older. So by the time I turned 10, I had taken over the care of my six younger brothers. My parents were working more than several jobs. 
I bathed them, I disciplined them, I did the homework with them, I washed all their clothes every week. I watched four or five baskets of clothes at 10 years old by myself. So, I got to my junior year in high school, and, so, and some of the students, you know, I played football too, I was a weak side linebacker. And I had so much anger in me, and you wouldn't believe other things that I went through. And so when I was a linebacker, when somebody came through the hole with a running bar, God helped me. <laughs> and I could legally do it without getting in trouble. And I did. My junior year, many other students would ask, hey, we want you to run for senior class president. I go, what? Senior class president, I go, if you do the posters and you put everything together, fine, I'll do it. Go ahead. So what they did was, they did. Marty Huntley had won class president for three years in a row, freshman, sophomore, and junior. And I thought, man, I can't beat Marty. Nobody beats Marty. <laughs> so what happened was I ran. And guess what happened? At the end of my junior year, this is what I hear over the loudspeaker. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to announce the results. Uh, new senior class president from 1975. 74, 75, Mr. Uh, Lewis Vasquez. I'm going, who the hell is that? Oh man, it was me. I won. Guess how I won. Guess how I won. Guess how I won. No, they didn't stop no battle. No, we didn't do nothing good. Stop it. Guess how I won. Huh? No, let me tell you how I won. Nobody counted on the special ed vote. <laughs> all the special ed students, all the special ed students voted, and I barely won by about five or eight votes. <laughs> that's how I became senior class president. The special ed students voted for me. So I go, great, I'm senior class president. And then, and then I go, well, what do I do now? <laughs> so I, I come back my senior year, I start my senior year, and then this is what the principal, Mr. William Yam. Man, I remember like it was yesterday. Come here, son. You realize you got to go to Rotary Club. I go, Rotary what? <laughs> Rotary Club. I go, well, I didn't know what it was. I go, okay. Okay, Mr. Yen. And I went around and asked anybody, what, what's Rotary Club? What's Rotary Club? And he said, hey, you got to take three other students with you. I go, okay. And there's going to be a luncheon and you got to get dressed up. I go, man, I got no clothes. See, we used to go to Catholic charities every Tuesday. And I used to sneak up to the front and go with my mother. And when I was young, about 10, 11 years old, if it was cold outside, you went to the coats first, the pants second, the shirts third, and the shoes last. But if it was in the summer, you went to the pants and shorts first, the shirt and then the shoes. I had a system down. And the reason I, I become such a good negotiator is I used to negotiate with the nuns and you'd have to pay three or four dollars for two bags of clothes. My mom would just sit there and smile because she just became this. And I would negotiate with the nuns and they thought I was cute. So I get two bags of clothes for 75 cents and I would pick clothes for all my brothers and sisters. So we gotta go to Rotary Club. What am I gonna wear? That's when I got my bow tie. I go, you know, I, I figured that's how people must dress, right? Got my bow tie, got my shirt, I bought my sports coat, I bought, I bought my pants. And I invited Rudy Olande, Luis Rodriguez, Hey, and look at that ponytails and throws too, okay? Okay, and, uh, uh, and David Vargas. So we go to Rotary. So we're all sitting there. We're all standing up. And it was all white senior men. They own all the businesses in town. No person of color, no Latinos, no, no, nobody. Else. And we're all standing there. And I'm going, Whoa. <laughs> One of the elders, gentlemen, nice guy, comes up, grabs my hand, and goes, Y'all gonna sit and eat with us? Because you're part of the Rotary Club. I know you're from the high school, Sterling Township High School. By the way, it was the first time in Sterling Township High School that they had a Latino senior class president in all these years. We sat down and they sat down between these different business owners. My friends are okay, what are we gonna do, man? They go, hey man, whatever the guy next to you do, you do it too. Because see, we never ate in a restaurant before. <laughs> the only restaurant we the first restaurant we ever ate. Because at home was mostly finger food. The first restaurant we ever ate at was McDonald's. And back at McDonald's in those days, when you bought a, a, a Big Mac, you could get it for 50 cents. And if you send a song to all these baddies, special sauce, little cheese, pickles, onions, on a sesame seed bun, you would get a free one. 
<laughs> and so after a while, we would go in groups, and we had a good chorus, and we would sing. <laughs> this is a true story. We would take our 50 cents and say, we're all, can you imagine us at McDonald's singing for our food? <laughs> and that's what we did to get that, uh, that extra Big Mac. After about three months, they quit having that special. <laughs> because, no, we would come in with, first we started with four people, then eight, and pretty soon we had like 10 of us who were singing for it. You know what, we sounded pretty good. Anyway, but that's where, that was the restaurant that we went to, and that's where we ate. So when we went to this, you know, I'm sitting down and look at all these dishes. You have a dish on top of a dish, extra four spoons, a knife at the top, a little, you know, for dessert, and I'm looking at and all this. And you know what the first thing I thought about? Please, please. Oh my God, I hope you don't have to wash these dishes. <laughs> that's what we were thinking, honestly. That's what we were thinking. So I said, I told everybody, look, whatever the guy next to you does, you do it. So they started off on the outside in. And I go, oh, okay, we can, we can do that. And I saw, and then when they finished the plate, they came to get the plate, and I go, well, do I give it up or let them take it? Because there was another one underneath. So finally, okay, I go, it's okay, guys, give it up, man, it's cool. So they took the plate. That was our first time we ever ate in a formal setting. Because remember, we all came from the west side of town, we were poor, and we never had ever been in a restaurant or a place like that. Time went on, I got to go to Rory Clubs. I learned how to eat from outside in. I learned what the different utensils were for and how to use them. There was no fault of my parents. They did the best they could with what they had and what they knew. And they made sure that we all ate. Well, time, and then the principal got mad at me because he said, you can only take students that are in the honor society to go to Rory Club. I wasn't in the honor society. And neither were one, none of my friends. So I had to pick others to go with me. And I, I went to every Rory Club meeting. So, I, so let's jump to my senior year. And this is what I looked like my senior year in high school. my pro, you know. I'm, I'm in government class and I'm sitting like right where you are back there. And this is Karen Bowles. I still talk to that woman. It was Karen, it was Karen Bozen, my high school social studies teacher. She was teaching government. And she's up here trying to teach. And everybody back there, and we're goofing around. I go, what, what's up, man? You know, well, when you're with your friends back then, OK, I grew up in the bottom. You say, what do you mean? What's up? Como esta, hermano? Hey, ponte trucha, si, simon. You know? And I'm Puerto Rican, and I speak that way. Because that's the I grew up in. Well, we're goofing around, and Mrs. Bozen goes, if any, if any of you think you can teach this class better than me, you come up to the front. You stood up. And I walked to the front of the class. All right, I was a smart ass. Okay, I walked to the front of the class, and she said, you're going to teach class for the next two days. You've got to use my lesson plans. And if you don't, you're the first one in your family that ever made it this far for high school. All my old relatives, almost none of them got past eighth grade. And she said, if you don't teach, you're going to have to go home and tell your mom and dad why you're not graduating. Because I will not pass you. You don't pass government, you don't graduate. And I thought, oh my God, I didn't stuck my foot in it. <laughs> so for the next few days, that woman, Miss Karen Bozen, taught me her lesson plan. She made me get up in front of the class to teach. And I got up to teach. I still stuttered a little bit ago. And, I could, and, I, and you know what? I loved it. I thought it was the coolest thing I ever did. Being able to open people's minds, being able to have information, being able to bestow knowledge. I thought, oh my God, oh my God, I made it. This is so cool. And the guys are messed around in the back, and I go back there. Hey, orale, man. Chill out, man. I need to teach right now. <laughs> and they did. And they did. They stay quiet. They're my buddies, man. We're blood, right? We got knowledge. If it was cool. The next day, she goes, after I got done teaching, she goes, you did a pretty good job, son. She goes, why don't you come to my class tomorrow? But I want you to go to the counselor's office and go get some college books. So I did. I went to the counselor's office. Miss Farber, five foot two, blonde hair, little blue eyes. And uh, this, there's another story about her. She ran off with the athletic director, but that's different. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I went in to see her and I go, Miss Farber, yeah. Miss Bolden said that I could come get some catalogs for college. And she goes, well, you know, you're really good with your hands. And you have four years of vocational classes. I think you make a very good mechanic. And I go, no, 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 Ms. Bozen said, I, I should bring the book. I go, I'm going to get in trouble, man. I, 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 I talk class. And she goes, you did what? I go, I talk class. She goes, you did what? She goes, well, I need, I need the catalogs. And she goes, no, I, I, I don't think so, son. I, I think you make a good mechanic. And I looked at her. And back then, I wasn't as patient as I am now. 
and not as wise as I am now? And I looked at him, you think I'm stupid or something or what? Do I look stupid to you? Do I look retarded? Because you have to remember, all those years of special ed and being called retarded, I still had it. I had it here, but I had to. I thought I was retarded. So anyway, cool. I go to Ms. Bolson, I said, Ms. Bolson, I got kicked out of counselor's office because she, she won't give me no catalogs. She goes, you come in tomorrow. I come in the next day to her, to her class, and she had a big long table. She said, all these catalogs sitting there. And she goes, pick a college, pick a school. Go, what? And she goes, where are you going to college? I go, this is for the ricos. College is for the rich, we don't know. So no, 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 pick a school. So I'm looking for these college. I go, I better do what she said, because she's flunked that can't graduate. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm looking through the picture, and I'm like, oh my god, look at this. Beautiful. Beautiful tree, green leaves, a lot of grass, big buildings. I thought it was the neatest thing I've seen in my life. I go, I'm going to go there. That was Illinois State University in normal Illinois. That's the school I had picked. And she goes, okay, now you got to apply. I go, Ms. Bozen, I don't have no money, man. I, you know, thank you, but you know, I can't ask. She goes, no, no, no. She wrote an application, and her husband worked as an accountant for the factory, where my dad worked. He, he had the application faxed. She paid for my application. And we filled it out together. So we filled it out together. We sent it in. Because you gotta remember, man, I got some pretty decent grades in my vocational classes. And my math. Woohoo! Because you say, you gotta take this thing and uh, call it ACT. I go, the ah, What's that for? Yeah. Never heard of it. Never heard of it. Yeah, my senior year, and this is March of my senior year in high school. Never heard of it. She goes, I'll pay for it. Back then, it only cost nine dollars to take that darn test. <laughs> and I go, I don't have nine dollars, you know. But my dad barely made enough to make it for months, months. So she paid for that. I took the ACT, and let me tell you what I got my ACT, just so you know. A nine in social science. A nine in science. A nine in English. 26 in math. <laughs> I could have been an engineer. Anyway, <laughs> that was my ACT. And when they prorated the scores, an overall prorate came out to 17. That's all you needed to go to Illinois State University. I got admitted. I go, whoa! I go, okay, that, okay, that felt good for that 30 seconds. I go, I can't go. She goes, no, you're going to go. No, I can't go. And by now it's about April. And then she goes, we're going to apply for financial aid, you know? And I go, what's that? I didn't know. We didn't know. We didn't know. My parents did the best they could with what they knew and how much they knew. We did not know. So she goes, you need your dad's income tax papers. And I go, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> no, for real. So I go to my dad, dad, dad. And my dad was in Nicolas Nicolás Vasquez said, dad, yeah. I need your income tax papers. For what? Well, I need for like, No. I said, meal. I'm a very proud man. Very proud Latino man. So what I did, he worked shifts. So I waited till the final week he worked 311. I broke into his box. And I stole the income tax papers. And I took them to Ms. Bolton, we filled it out. My dad found out. And then I was. <laughs> that one lasted about three days, man. That was painful. Anyway, so I had applied. But guess what? I had applied way too late. All the financial was gone. And then at, the, at, at about that same time, my dad's factory uh, went on strike. So I took a job uh, at Illini B sanitation crew on the slaughter floors. So I, I went to high school, and, and my teacher would yell at me. I, I, when I got out of high school, I worked from four in the afternoon. I lied about my age, I was to be 21, but they, took, they thought I was 21, I lied. And I worked from four in the afternoon to two in the morning, and I catch the bus to go to school from where we live in the neighborhood, okay? At 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning to go to school. I would fall asleep in my classes, and uh, the teachers were yelling at me and thought, well, you must be out partying every night and so forth. And I never said nothing to nobody. Every week, I signed my check and I give it to my father. I made like 80 bucks a week and I gave it to my father so he could feed the family. But they were on strike, he had no money. And back then, the unions, they, they took your dues and just didn't give you nothing back. Well, I kept saying, damn, I'm gonna go to college. I'm only gonna go to college. No, no, I'm gonna go to college. Commencement day comes, and guess who got to give the commencement speech? 
I did. And I practiced and I practiced and I practiced and I went. And after I graduated, you know, my dad came down and you know, he goes, he shook my hand. I go, well, dad, everybody else having parties and we couldn't afford anything. And my dad said, que bueno. And that was it. That was it. I, I kept working, and then what I started to do, I started to catch my checks before I gave them to my father. Because I was putting away $25 at a time. I thought, you know, I'm going to go to college, right? So then, I was supposed to go to orientation, and the same day orientation in July, at Illinois State University was the same time I was supposed to run a marathon. I used to run track. I was a half miler and a miler. I used to run a mile in 426. Fastest I ever got. Couldn't get me going there. Uh, state time in Illinois at that time was 421. I was fast, but not fast enough. So by that time, we switched job, and I started working at the factory. I lied about my age there, too. They paid a little more. It's sweet, you know, to push the Well, it came to July, and one of my friends, and I go, hey, man, I want to go to orientation. I told my dad, yeah, I'm going. Tu no vai, yeah, I'm going. And so tu no vai means you're not going to go. So I go, okay, fine. So that day, I was, supposed to go, uh, uh, I was supposed to go to work, I had my lunch pail, I had, I had my little taquitos in there, my burrito, whatever. And I pretend like I was going to work, my friend picked me up, you know, to, to go to work, and we drove to Illinois State University, it was two and a half hour drive. And I figured, well, you know, what's my dad going to do when I call him on the phone? He can't get me, right? <laughs> dad, how come you're not home from work? Um, I'm at Illinois State. What? I go, well, it's okay though, he's far away. So, you know. <laughs> and so he yells at me, I go to orientation, and when I go to orientation, I got input with these kids from the private schools from Chicago, and they were, you know, registering them. They, they put me in astronomy, calculus, anthropology, and psychology. And I had been stashing away $25 at a time, right? And, you know, put some money away, sometimes 15 sometimes 20 more. So I, I, I get back, and then my dad goes, okay, yeah? Yeah. Okay, this college thing? Yeah? Yeah. Well, then I told him, uh, by the way, when I was there for orientation, I needed a place to live. And they already sent me to the uh, uh, clearing house to get housing. And this is what happened. I go in there, and they go, you need a $150 deposit, son, to get an apartment. I go, what? 150, I didn't even know what a deposit was, and they're asking me for money. I don't even know you. <laughs> so, how many of you have been to Illinois State University? Okay. How many know what Watterson Towers is? They're two of the biggest dormitories in the whole country. One block over from Watterson Towers is Broadway Street. I had gone to a clearing house, and I didn't have no 150 stuff, and I, wasn't give, I was not going to give up everything I had. The net, and I begged the RAs, and the RAs took care of me, and they gave me meal tickets and let me stay for an extra two days. Extra two days. And then what ended up happening? The next morning, I got up at 7 a.m., and I went on Broadway Street, and I went from house to house. I got bed for a place to live. Come to school. I begged. I went from house to house, and I got not beg people to take me in. That's the oddest got you. I get to the corner and there's this house called the Tiki House. It was really Tiki Fraternity. I had no idea what the hell that meant. <laughs> <laughs> I walked in there and there's Chuck and Dolphin, this Italian from New York. And he, he couldn't get admitted to any schools in New York and he got admitted to Elmwood State University. And his parents gave him a two bedroom apartment all by himself. And I didn't know I was knocking on doors and he answered, I go, hey Chuck, you know, his name Chuck me introduce himself. And I told him my story and he goes, you know what, my parents are rich. Why don't you just stay with me the first two months? You don't have to pay nothing, man. Don't worry about it. I thought, really? He goes, yeah. I goes, don't worry about it. He had a good heart. Open mind and a good heart. Cool. So I go home and I tell my parents, and I kept in touch with him. And I, got, I told my parents, hey, I'm going to go to college. August 22nd, I'm going to go. And I don't have to know you're not going. I showed them on a the map, and they still didn't believe me. See, I graduated from high school when I was 17 years old. I didn't turn 18 until August 26th, and, and I was going to leave August 22nd. So August 22nd, so I go and I quit my job, come, you know, two days before I was supposed to leave. And I told Riz Rodriguez, look, man, you come up to my house, 5.30 in the morning on August 22nd, and you be there to pick me up, man, and I'm going to sneak out. I'm going to sneak out. 5.30 came, no Reese. 
6.30 came, no reason. I'm like, damn, everybody starts to wake up, right? My six younger brothers, my sister's there, my mom's in the kitchen, I'm like, oh man. Because I had packed, I had, how many remember those old brown big grocery bags? And one I had all my clothes, the other one I had a pots and pans, and I had my guitar. I used to sing and play guitar. I can't read music, but I sing and play. I used to sing and uh, back in coffee houses. So here I go. Finally, Luis shows up. His car broke down, so he brought his brothers. You know what he drove? A 1971 four-door Datsun Baby Blue Station. I remember it like it was yesterday. And he pulls up in the driveway. I threw my stuff in, and I go into the bedroom, and my sister will come out of my bed, out of the bedroom. And she grabs me, she goes, No te vayas, mijo, no, no, nunca te va a ver. Don't leave, you're never going to come back, we're never going to see you again, don't leave. I go, I got to go. And to this day, I can't tell you how I left. But something inside me, I knew I had to go. I go to the kitchen, my mom starts crying and going, Mijo, don't leave, man, don't leave, nunca te va a ver, I'm never going to see you again, please. I go, Ma, I gotta go, man, I gotta go. I go outside, my six brothers jumped at me on the grass and held me down and go, man, don't go, bro, man, don't go, man, you gotta stay. I go, I gotta go, I gotta go. I get to the front of the Blue Dodger Station, uh, uh, and you'll see, that, that's my father and mother, that's my father and mother. I get to the, uh, the front of the station wagon, and my father's standing there, and I go, I'm going to college. He grabbed my hand and goes, Ahora te haces hombre. Now you become a man. That's all he said. That was it. That was it. My brother Nelson, the one that follows me, said, Dad, can I go to take you? By then I'm crying like I do here right now. I'm crying. <laughs> See, I am a sensitive man. And I'm crying. And I get in the backseat of the car because my brother and Rizzo think was driving. That ride from Sterling, Illinois to, to Normal was about two and a half hours. I cried the first two hours. I cried, man. Que chillo, me la cried almost close on everything. I cried almost all the way to Illinois State. I get to Illinois State, and we get to the Tiki House, right? I put my stuff in the, uh, in the apartment. Well, that lasts about five minutes. I only have two sacks, right? And I'm sitting in the front yard, you know, and they're parked on the side. And I go, you guys are going, huh? And I'm sitting there thinking, what am I doing? What am I doing? And then I, they go, let's go eat something. Well, I only had $150 in my back pocket. That's all I had to say because I had given all my money to my father. No, let's go eat something. I go, okay, guess where we went? McDonald's and normal. And guess what we did when we got there? That's right, because they didn't know us there yet. Okay, so we get in there and we, and we sing the song. Two obvious patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions, and sesame seed bun. And the lady comes out with the, with the Big Mac, we got that free one. So I start to pull out my money and, me, and my brother now goes, no, 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 man, put that away. I go, what, man, he doesn't have the money. No, put that away, he goes. He pulled out a $20 bill, he goes. Dad told us to feed you before we got you. Dad told us to feed you before we got you. And he paid for my burgers. Damn, I cried all the way back. I can see it like it was yesterday. So I get back to the apartment and they leave. And I'm sitting there, I must have cried half that day. And I'm sitting in the room, Chuck was gone. He had gone to New York, he was flying back later. And I'm going, oh my God, what am I gonna do, man? So okay, so I started going to classes. And I realized, it cost more than $150 to go to college. <laughs> I didn't know, honestly. I did not know. So I lied about my age again. And I became a Pinkerton security guard. I walked the catwalks at Old Inaco, Owens Corny, and GE. Catwalks about 200 feet high and a little like this. And he had to walk around with this little clock and I had my uniform. And I would clock to make sure I did the rounds. I did the 11 to 7 shift, 40 hours a week, 11 at night till 7 in the morning, Monday through Friday. My fraternity brothers at that time, I go, look, I don't have any money. Because when I got that first bill for $3,000, and that was for everything, tuition, books, everything, $3,000 for the whole year. I only had $150. I go, man, I don't think this is going to cut it. And so, and you know what I did? Uh, the brothers in that house, they would get up, okay, they would take me to work at night. 
And there would be, somebody would always be there at 7 a.m. to come pick me up and bring me back. I was starving, man. So I did what any good student would do. I bought a gallon of peanut butter. <laughs> and I bought a gallon of jelly. You know, cheap stuff. You know, stuff that says great value or has a yellow label, but there's really no name on it, so you kind of hope it's what it is. <laughs> That's what I had. And I went to the Wonder Bread store on the day old bread. I, I paid a quarter loaf. I ate peanut butter and jelly for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for a whole month. I look at peanut butter now, it just, oh God. <laughs> but I did, I took out my first check, and then, I, and then I started paying. And it still wasn't enough. So on the weekend, I took a job at Cape and Cinema to be an assistant manager at the theater. I was working 60 hours a week. My first semester, and my dad would call me and say, son, how you doing? And guess what I said? What do you think I said? I'm doing great, right. Dad, man. You won't believe how great life is. <laughs> I'm doing real nice. I mean, papi, estoy bien, man. No, no se apure, man. No se apure, man. I mean, don't worry about me. I hang up the phone. I cry. Well, guess what? That first semester, I worked so many hours, I got a 1.69. 1.69. The class just blew me out of the water. The only one I was passing was math. Good figure, right? And. I got punished for speaking Spanish when I was a little kid. When I was in high school, they told me I couldn't take Spanish because you need a foreign language, you know, to go to college. I didn't know. But they said because I already spoke it, you shouldn't take it. <laughs> I went to the dean of the college there uh, of education at, at, at Illinois State University, and I've been I can't go home, sir. I can't go home. Please give me another chance. I can't go home. Because in 1975, there were 22,300 students at Illinois State University, and nine of us were Latinos on the whole campus. We started ALAS, the Association of Latin American Students. So what happened was that he gave me one more chance. He goes, son, I'm going to give you one more chance, but that's it. You know, so I've got to let you go. I had no financial or anything. I switched majors to Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> and I got a 2.9 that second semester, even though I was working 60 hours a week. I worked 60 hours a week. It took me five years to get out of college. And I paid everything cash. I didn't know about loans. I didn't know about you know financial or anything. And then because I made so much, I didn't qualify for anything anyway. So then it came time for graduation. And I told I told my dad, my undergraduate. By the way, I have a bachelor's in Spanish and a minor in for political science. I thought I was going to be a politician. <laughs> <laughs> graduation day came. It was May. May 11th, 1980, at Illinois State University. I remember like it was yesterday. My commencement speaker, who inspired the hell out of me, was Andrew Young. He spoke in my commencement. He spoke in my commencement. And I'm sitting in there, and I, I think I was the only Latino you know, graduating that day, and I, I'm sitting, and my dad and mom didn't want to come, they didn't want to come, and my cousin went, no, no, you gotta go, you gotta go. I'll drive you, you gotta go, it's a two and a half hour drive. So he brought them. This is what they dressed up. This is what they were wearing on my graduation. And you can't see my dress that bright flowers and everything. So, and they didn't speak English. So I'm sitting in the audience, you know, we're outside and getting ready to graduate. I look up in the stands, man, I saw my parents like that. Man, they were like, glow in the dark, glow in the dark. And I realized how afraid they must have been to be there with all those people that they couldn't understand what they were saying around them. They didn't know who they were. They were scared to death, but they came to my graduation. Graduated and I, I, I got offered a job at IBM at, at 21.5 and I got offered a job to be a child abuse investigator for, as a social worker at $11,900. Guess which job I took? The social worker. Because I figure if people help me, I need to help others. I need to help others. So I became a social worker. I was a child abuse investigator. I did it for almost three years and now we're going to zoom up. These are my six brothers. My sisters won't let me put pictures up. <laughs> Out of my brothers, I have, uh, let me see if this thing works here. This one has a bachelor's uh, in math uh, from the University of Iowa, and he has a master's degree also, and he teaches math in Rockwell, Illinois. This one has a bachelor's uh, in education and a master's in math, and he teaches 
at, uh, um, in, in Columbus, Ohio, the middle school. This one works as a record specialist for the hospital. Now, this guy was the one that retired from the Army, sharpshooter. We won't talk about this one. And this one, Willie, um, manager of the grocery store. By the way, this one retired from the Navy. And this is my baby brother, who, who at one point I had Johnny, Nicolás, and Miguel with me at the University of Iowa living in my apartment trying to get them through college. And two of them got out, including myself. The rest of them did well, and the other one got a trade. So then what happened is Iowa City needed somebody in charge of graduate and undergraduate recruitment. And they said, why don't you apply? See, I met Arturo Sierra. Arturo Sierra, my best friend for 32 years, and he died of cancer about five years ago. That would really hurt me. That, that. Because you see, Arturo and I, we were like brothers. And he worked at the community college uh, in Dixon, Illinois, uh, the South Valley Community College. And when I was a social worker, every time I would terminate parental rights, I was in court every week. I was also a court interpreter. So what, what I would do is when I would terminate parental rights, I would call Arturo, and we would put the kids in the community college to make sure they all got associate's degrees. So we developed a pipeline. And we had all these kids, and nobody could believe, how in the hell are these kids coming from such broken homes getting associate degrees? And we had quite a few that we were sending through. And then he goes to the University of Iowa, and I don't see him for about three months, and they go, hey, they got an opening here for a recruiter, why don't you apply? It says here you need a master's. Don't worry, I talked to them, and they might be willing to interview you, depending on your background. It says related experience, Louise, don't worry about it. I applied. I interviewed, didn't hear nothing for two months, so I kept doing my job. The University of Iowa hired me. They hired me. So I go to the University of Iowa for three and a half years. I was in charge of undergraduate and graduate minority recruitment. I worked at Special Support Services, Minority Affairs Office. And I traveled all over, and let me tell you that I honed down my etiquette skills. I knew what restaurants to I knew what to order, I knew how to use my spoons and forks, I knew what the plates were for. Man, I had it, I had it, I had it down. And right when I was there, okay, I needed the one ahead. This is my beautiful wife's associate dean of the College of Education at Mexico State University. We've been together 32 years. When I went, when she came from Del Rio, Texas to um, uh, to uh, University of Iowa, she, she was starting her first year in a doctor. Super smart woman. She did uh, her bachelor's degree at uh, Texas State University in three years with a 4.0. Three years of 4.0, because she didn't want to get in debt. She got her master's degree while working full-time as an elementary teacher in San Antonio at University of Texas San Antonio in bilingual multicultural studies. Yeah. And uh, she did that in two years with a 4.0 while working full-time. And so when she came to University of Iowa, I fell in love. My heart went pitter patter, and that was it. It was over. <laughs> <laughs> so I fell in love. And I, and I said, well, you know, and she goes, you could do this. Go ahead. And I go, well, you could do this. So I took six hours, you know, because I graduated from Illinois State with a 2.2 grade point average. So they said that I could take classes as long as I had, uh, I had, had to get an A and a B. Make a long story short, I did that. And they gave me a fellowship for one year. The Educational Opportunity Program grant. Paid everything but just one year. That master's degree was two years. It was almost 60 hours. So... During that time, I was scared to death and I quit my job and my dad hit the ceiling and said, what do you mean, man? I was making 23000 a year. My dad goes, why are you giving up such a job? What are you doing? What are you doing? And uh, I got enrolled in my master's degree. I got up and they put me on probation after I got the 3.5 for my two classes. I took 16 hours the first semester, 16 hours the second, 10 in the summer, and I graduated with my master's degree in one year with a 3.35. During that time, I met Dr. Ursula Gower, five foot four Irish Catholic woman, and she's tough as nails, man. <laughs> I was the only, only man that she, I was the first and only man she graduated with a PhD until three years later. She used to eat away from us, you say. Ursula goes, Grace. Oh, and she smoked a lot. Okay. Grace, <laughs> gonna get a doctorate. And I go, I don't know. She goes, that wasn't a question. <laughs> and you never said no to this woman. Next you know, I applied at the University of Iowa for the doctorate program. 
It was ranked number three in the country in counseling psychology, and they only admitted eight people. And then, and I got in. I got in. And this woman, and by the way, by that time, um, my my wife then, okay, she and I, we got married. We had a baby the first year, and uh, and our doctor, don't do that, by the way. <laughs> we, had a baby, we had a baby the first year in our doctor program. And since I had grown up taking care of kids and all that stuff, you know what we did? She liked to watch L.A. Law and 30-something, for those of you who remember those shows. <laughs> so on Tuesday and Thursdays, those were my national study. Monday and Wednesdays were hers. When I had the babies, I fed them, I took care of them, I put them to sleep, you know, washed the dishes, cleaned the house. On Tuesday and Thursdays, okay, she would do that for me. On Fridays, we would have family time. Saturday morning to about Saturday afternoon family time. If whoever had an exam on Monday or Tuesday, they got to have those days for the exams to study, okay? So we both graduated with our PhDs, and she was the first Mexican-American woman to graduate with a PhD in school psychology from the University of Iowa. We were the only two Latinos in the program. Man, they only brought us one in at a time every four to five years. So I, I, I was the only one in the program for four or five years, and she was the only one for four or five years. Right when we get ready to graduate, they brought in two more. <laughs> so, uh, the day, uh, and, uh, and my family did in Sterling, so if I was never came to visit Harley, her family was in Del Rio, Texas, so we had our first baby. She had to have an emergency cesarean. And I'm by myself in the hospital, and I'm going, oh, God, you know, and, and this story, she'd kill me if I, if I told you the story. I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> and the doctor goes, I go, you know, you may have to make a choice. And I go, please, please, let my wife live. I put on my greens and I went in there and they covered in she had a cesarean. I talked to her that they didn't put her to sleep on hero. I talked to her the, for the whole time when I saw them cut her up and we had our baby. And I'm sitting there and then uh, and it turned out okay. I'm sitting in the waiting room after it was over because it took my baby to intensive care to make sure because it was an emergency cesarean. And I was with my wife and I talked to her and she finally fell asleep. And I'm sitting out in the waiting room by myself with my hands like this. A nurse comes. Mr. Vasquez, Mr. Vasquez, yeah, your mother's here. My mother? <laughs> it was Ursula Delworth. <laughs> because see, when she was younger, she marched with Cesar Chavez in California, and she knew some Spanish, and she came in speaking Spanish, she goes, soy la mamá, soy la mamá, and she came in. And this is what advised her to mention us, she held my hand, and we prayed together. And then she opened her bag, and she had a little bottle of Jack Daniels. <laughs> but it was for real. She liked to, you know, So we celebrated in the hospital. She snuck it in for me, and we drank together. <laughs> so, both my wife and I. We got recruited to uh, New Mexico State University. I was at the University of Iowa. And then we both uh, became uh, associate professors. I became department head for the counseling and then psych department. Uh, at that time, there were seven white males and one white female, no minority faculty in that department. Less than 12% of our students at that time across the three programs, school psychology, counseling psych, and mental health counseling at that time, uh, less than 12% were minorities. I barely became an associate professor, and we had a coup in my department, and they were going to smell it. Uh, and the dean came, and he interviewed all of us, and he pulled me aside. He goes, I want to make you department head. I go, what? I just became an associate professor. I want to make you department head. You got one year to turn this around. If you don't turn it around, we're going to smell the department, and we're going to have to take part, and uh, the department ceases to exist. I never worked so hard in my life. Mm -hmm. I turned the department around. We ended up with three national accreditations. I was department here for six and a half years. We ended up, now we have over 67% minorities across all three programs. And I have almost all women minorities um, in the department before I left the department head. Because at that time they figured, oh man, this man can do something. 
So they made me associate dean of the graduate school. I got a call from the president of the university. In the meantime, my wife became associate professor first. I became associate professor second. And then she uh, had been, and then I became associate dean of the graduate school. She had been associate dean of the graduate school too at some point. And then what happened was uh, when, I, when I went up for full professorship, I had a hard time. I had a hard time. I was doing research on only minorities within group differences and so forth. And people kept asking me, what's your comparison group? And I go, I am. I'm doing within group comparisons. Anyway, the provost decided I got tenured. Um, I got promoted to full professor. A year later, my name was uh, nominated. I was nominated for the regents professor and Dow chair. And other regents professors, when they voted, I almost got a full unanimous vote from across the campus. And I became an endowed chair. And then at that time, and I was started to be known as a fixer, and I still don't like that because I, I have a tendency to stay cool under conflict, and I fix things. My wife at that time had become a uh, deputy director and associate dean of the honors uh, college. Then she became a full professor also, and then what happened was that uh, I was chair of the institute review board, and we were having all kinds of problems when it took over. There was all kinds of problems. So knowing me, I started to restructure the whole thing, the whole bit. And then I told the president, you need to have an associate vice president for research integrity because this is a mess over here. And he goes, well, what do you think? I go, I'll write the job description. So I wrote my own job description. <laughs> and the president said, okay, then you'll be the founding person in that. And that's how I got that position. And I left the graduate school. My wife went back to full professor. She got tired of being uh, uh, in administration. And lately, when we have an excellent uh, new dean now, the first time uh, we have a Pan-American Afro dean. We have had one African-American, but this is the Afro. Uh, he's also a Panamanian. And I've known him for 23 years. We're, we're psychologists down for days. So she, she, she interviewed and competed. She became associate dean of the College of Education since August. And so we're both in this together. Been 32 years, my boys are doing fine. I have an oldest boy that's 29. He's taking the scenic route. Hopefully none of you would do that. Did you piss off your parents and you do that stuff? <laughs> and then uh, my youngest son just finished uh, his master's degree in, edu in education. Okay. And this is how I find most of the days. Sometimes I live to eight, nine o'clock at night. But as you can see, I didn't do it by myself. See, my parents, I learned from my parents. Endurance, motivation, and a high tolerance for pain. <laughs> From Mrs. Bolson, I learned nothing can stop you from the sacrifice. From uh, Dr. Ursula Dower, she's by the way she smoked a lot too. I hated going to her office because you know we had no smoking policy. You saw me talking about that earlier. She stuffed a towel underneath the door and smoked all day long. <laughs> <laughs> so I go to her an advice meeting. <laughs> Whoa! She goes, I don't want to go in there. <laughs> no, because I would come out smelling like the, I, I smoke in the preface. Say, you've been smoking in the building, Mr. Vasquez. <laughs> so, and, uh, just to tell you that we have fun, I told everybody I went to Rack Ride. That's that trip across the state of Iowa, 492 miles. My wife and my youngest boy and I rode our bicycles pedaling across the state of Iowa. From so, the money I paid and so forth, we use it, we have fun together. You see that camel up there in the corner? I sent that to my staff, didn't I, Michelle? Michelle was on my staff. I sent that on hump day. I go, look, man, hump day. Like, oh, no. <laughs> That's when I met Herky. He was on the trail. That's me, of course. And there were over 18,000 bikers. We, we spent six nights together camping and so forth. So what did I learn from all this? What did I learn? Oh, man. Thank God. I learned how to communicate. Because you know what? 7% of what you say are your words. 38% is the tone infliction. How many of you know when your parents are upset with you? <laughs> how do you know? Even by their what? <laughs> tone. Oh, they give you the look, right? Yeah. <laughs> look, body language 55%. You know what that means? 93% of your communication comes from body language and your tone infliction. 93%. It's only 7% are the words. And by the way, I love diversity. When I was with Arturo, I spent 13 years doing the Nipi ceremonies, which are the sweat lodges, working with the shaman and the medicine man. 
I also spent almost two years, what, a year and a half to almost two years attending a black, all black Baptist church. I was the only non-black in the audience, and I loved it. You got to remember you said fro. And I also attended Mormon church, uh, Irish Catholic, okay? And I got involved with Spiritistas. So I've been around a little bit with all these different cultures and why. I even attended a white Baptist church. And I was so stupid. I tried to put the black Baptist church and white Baptist church together <laughs> for a Sunday cookout. And I'm the only one that showed up. <laughs> you know, I mean, the black Baptist church also showed up, but not the other. They were afraid to come into the neighborhood. So there I was having a good time with hot dogs and everything, Kool-Aid. And hold it. So, well, what I realized is communication. Communication. Now, watch the next slide carefully. Are you ready? Yeah. When we first see each other, what do we see? We see our gender, we see our color, then we hear the words, and then we wonder what the task is going to be that we have to do, right? Am I wrong? No. no. Now, that is called low context communication. What is low-context communication? When that's what we see and that's what we stick to. Now what happens when you're actually in the academic setting? Are you ready? We start to see the social setting we're in. And we start to wonder, am I okay? Is it cool? Social status. Sometimes we notice that others have more than we do. Sometimes we notice that others have less than we do. But we notice and we can tell. How many of you can tell when somebody's poor? How many, how many of you can tell when somebody's rich? Have you heard of the vocabulary? If I were to talk to you like this right now, you'd wonder if I'm smart or not, but laugh. <laughs> but if I were to talk to you like this, hello, how are you? What the hell is it? I mean, that was Ringo Starr. And you know what? Ringo Starr came from Liverpool. They were considered some of the poorest singers in the world. But we over here heard that accent, and guess what we thought? Wow, that's so cool. <laughs> so, but we didn't know. But you hear the Spanish, that, that's just an English from here. Culture. All of your insiders into your own culture. You know how to behave around your grandparents. You know how to behave around your elders, don't you? And you know how to behave with your aunts and uncles, right? When auntie comes over and so forth, do you behave? How many of you behave? Right. Okay. <laughs> Language preferences. How many of you know how to speak when you're out there? When I go home and I run into my vatos, I go, it. And we say hello like this, it takes us half hour. <laughs> when I'm at, at the college and I'm talking to my graduate students, I talk like this. It's great to know. Now we're going to talk about some theoretical concepts, and we're going to look at the process of acculturation, identity, worldview, and we're going to look how they impact the overall personality development that each of you have within you as you evolve into your interpersonal relationships upon this campus and see how you will go forward. When I go see the president of the university, this I talk. President Travis, how are you? You know, it's been a pleasure to meet with you today and I'm looking forward to this meeting. By the way, I have a win-win situation. I've been looking over my budgetary concerns, but I've also had found that there's a possibility with your help and your in-kind help and producing such the money that I would need to produce such an institution involving the grant that I could bring students here. I think it would be a win-win. We, we can increase the retention and the graduation of our students. And in return, you will get more tax dollars. And overall, all of us will benefit. And this university will become a premier university, a premier university for the greatest enterprise of all, which would be our students. Sure, it how much you need. No, that's not good. <laughs> but did you notice the difference? Context. You don't give up who you are. You expand your skills to the places that you're going to be. Okay. And then we have intelligence. By the way, by the time you reach 21, 18 to 21, you're not going to get any smarter than what you are. You're going to learn more, but your intelligence taps out. I'm sorry. You're leveled out. It's all mine. Okay. But it doesn't mean you can't learn. It just it means that whatever I, our IQ is going to be is going to be about the same at the age of 18 to 20 as it is at 15, 16, and so forth. Oops. Personality, how you are. How many of you are extroverted? Okay, about five, seven, eight. How many of you are introverted? Wow, that's quite a few. You believe I was introverted? No. Okay, 
tone, gestures. How many of you chopping your hands? I do. I look like I'm sitting out there in the airport trying to chase the place away. Okay. History. Our history. And you know what that means? The history we have with our families. How it is that we talk to each other. How it is that we love each other. How it is that we hate on each other. How it is that we deal with conflict. How it is that we deal with, uh, with stresses. Uh, I, I'll spend 50 minutes with you. By the time I'm done, I can tell you how you deal with stresses. I can find out. I do it all the time. And all of this is involved with what? Emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence you can always increase. Your personality and your intelligence balance up. Your emotional intelligence you can always learn how to deal with your anger. You can learn how to deal with your stresses. You can learn how to be successful. You can learn how to believe that you're worth something. You can learn. But look what happens. When you have emotional intelligence, just what happens to your emotions? They, they go through your limbic system, right here. They go through the limbic system, and that's where you feel. Some of us, it stops there, because we get it what? We start pulling out concealed weapons when somebody cuts us off on the highway. <laughs> we start screaming at each other. At the, I was at Walgreens the other day. I was getting some medication. And they said, Yo, it'll be ready in a half hour, sir. I well, sure, it's not that time. And I go, do I have to wait in line? Oh, no, no, you can come right up. As soon as we call your name, it's ready. Other people were in line. There was a little bottle. They're in line. And they go, Mr. Lasky, yeah, your medication's ready. So I walk up and he goes, what are you doing? You button in front. I go, really? So, so I told the lady behind the glass, look, I don't want any trouble. I can wait until everybody goes, no, no, no. I told you to come up. Man, you left your my kick cat. And I'm like, oh, man, really? So I was very, very calm. I go, look, are we really going to do this? I don't think it's in your best interest nor mine. And he got real quiet and put his head down. I go, got my medication. I made it halfway down the aisle. He goes, He's lucky he's that. I was gonna kick his ass. <laughs> so, what you want is you want your emotion to go from the limbic system to the frontal lobe. Why? Because that's where you think rationally and you can balance that. You can balance that. So here you go. Emotional intelligence impacts your intelligence and your personality. Now, this is what you all have to really pay attention to. Emotional intelligence is the foundation that impacts decision making, change tolerance. Impacts time management, impacts assertiveness, impacts empathy, communication, social skills, presentation skills, stress tolerance, customer service, accountability, flexibility, anger management, trust. Your emotional intelligence is what allows you to deal with things if you're able to think about it enough to make the best out of it. So what do you need for emotional intelligence? Self-awareness, you, you have to know. I know when I'm getting excited, and I know when my tears almost lost it in here a few times because when I think back of my history, I see it, I relive it. It's almost like having like a PTSD. You, it comes to life. And you can't tell me any of you here had never gone through that. I drive up next to people on the highway and we stop at the stoplight, right? We come up to a stoplight, and the person next to me, a young lady, be sitting there going, and I'm over here, okay, she either heard a sad song or somebody did something to her, and do I want to talk to her? How many of you have that happen to you? You hear a song, and all of a sudden, <laughs> I can't believe you stole my tennis shoes. Okay, so, <laughs> you know, social management, using your awareness of your emotions to stay flexible and direct your behavior in a positive way. Social awareness, and this is where you get into your your relationships, the ability to pick up others' emotions and understand what is really going on. But you can't do that unless you listen, unless you listen and you observe and you understand. Relationship management, the ability to use your awareness of your own emotions and those of others to manage and interact successfully. My wife and I have been together 32 years, and you can ask her, I wish she was here. I have never in my life in 32 years ever cussed at that woman. That's never. 32 years I never cussed at that woman. Never. I wish it was the same the other way, but you know. <laughs> so, let's talk about what this looks like in real life. Are you ready? Are you ready? No, she's a fine lady, man. I want to dance. You know we still go dancing? Aww. We still go to the movies together? And we even hold hands. Aww. I know. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you about the imposter syndrome. Let's put this to real life. You know what the imposter syndrome is? When you tell yourself, am I really good enough? 
Should I be here? Do I belong? How many of you have ever felt that? What am I doing here? Do I fit? Do I belong? Do I fit? Do I belong? Other people's behavior should never ever dictate how you feel about yourself. Never. Apply emotional intelligence to the imposter syndrome. This is what you do. Are you ready? Self-awareness. Change your thinking. Start to reframe your thoughts. Take out those cassette tapes or the, I'm sorry, CDs <laughs> or your Mac B, whatever it is that you hear inside your head. Take those thoughts out that keep telling you, I'm no good. I'm not cool. I'm only here because I'm a minority. I'm only here because I'm not here. I'm going to take those tapes out. They have no room in your head to have those tapes. Take those tapes out. So, so management. You need some proof, right? Because even though you might say, okay, I'm going to fight this, I'm going to fight this. Oh, God, it's so hard. I need some help. Your mentors. Dr. Perkins. Mentor. Dr. Riley. Mentor. And all the other professors here. Mentor. They'll tell you, you're, you're smart. And you can, you can do this, but you need to listen, you need to trust me, and sometimes you need to hang on. I heard that earlier today, and that's so true. I hung on to Dr. Delworth, and she got me through. They will tell you the truth. You wouldn't be here unless you were smart. And I talked to many of you, and I know you're intelligent, but don't ever, ever tell me I can't do it. What you can tell me is, I'm going to try, can you help me? That I can do. That I can do. Relationships, okay, social, uh, social awareness, knowing your peers. Sometimes you gotta pick who your friends are gonna be. When I was younger, I had some lethal friends. You know what that means? That always got me in trouble. And when I didn't have no money, I didn't have no friends. So I started surrounding myself with who? People that had my best interests in mind. People that I knew loved me, people that I knew they were willing to sacrifice for me. Relationship management, own your expertise, dignity, integrity, excellence, and pay it forward. And I've seen many of you do that with, with each other, looking out for each other. The other night, I saw. They said, well, are we leaving? No, no, no. I can't. We can't leave her behind. We're going to wait till she comes out. Or, or are we going for a walk? Yeah, yeah. But wait a minute. Six of us would be cool. So we all, and I saw you all stick together. How come? Why? Best interest. And you take care of each other. We're like we take care of each other. Words of wisdom. Is this making sense to you, what I've shared with you tonight? Yes, sir. I am here because I stand on the shoulders of many that have come before me. And there'll be many to come after me. And I want someday to come back here and see one of you tell your story up here. Hopefully, you'll know that you need more than $150 to go to college. <laughs> hopefully, you'll like peanut butter. I'm not real crazy about it. And hopefully, you will know the things that I never did when I first started school. Because you see, remember, I was diagnosed retarded. I was EMH, ed educationally mentally handicapped. I went from EMH to PhD. And here I stand before you. And if I could go through all that and get through, my God with the privileges and the opportunities and the support you have, there's no reason why all of you in this room can't get through. Our words of wisdom, always have an open mind and good heart. Eyes that see, ears that listen, share words that heal. The embrace of yourself, the embrace of diversity. Be a healing presence for each other. We don't have to put each other down. You don't like how somebody dresses? So what? They might not like how you smell. <laughs> you might not like how somebody's shoes are, so what? They might not like the color of your shirt. But does that mean that we have to use the words to hurt each other? And I'm going to leave you with this thought. Get rid of your ethnic racial barometers. You know what those are? I wrote an article on this. This is when we wear a little barometer here that says, okay, I'm Latino, right? Let's do the Latino bar barometer. <laughs> oh man, you 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 can be Latina. You don't speak Spanish, man, like I do. Como estas, man? You don't sabe hablar, and we tear each other down because we can't speak, or we're not dark enough, or we're too light, or we walk around. Oh man, look at that brother. He speaks so proper and he can't dance. 
Yeah, you laugh at you know what I'm talking about. And so <laughs> we don't need that ethnic racial barometer because we have enough to deal with without us tearing each other apart. So with that, I leave you tonight. Thank you for listening to our story. I appreciate it, and thank you very much. <laughs>